Hello everyone, welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I am your host, as always, James W. Gesso. Today's interview is with Dr. Oliver Grundman, and it is all about Kratom. Oliver Grundman, PhD, is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry at the College of Pharmacy, University of Florida. From an early age, he was interested in plants and their ethnobotanical uses, which motivated him to study pharmacy in his native of Germany. He then continued his studies on the neuropharmacology and specifically antidepressant and anxiolytic effects of plant extracts during his graduate work. He remains curious and passionate about psychoactive plants, which got him interested in Kratom in recent years. Dr. Grundman is one of the few people who have been a part of one of the few research studies that have gone on around Kratom, and I'm very happy to have him on the show to talk about this wonderfully interesting uh, opioid plant. Of course, Kratom is not a psychedelic, but it is usually the kind of people who are into psychedelics who are likely also interested in Kratom. Uh, It's one of those types of plants that seems to have a wide range of uses from medical to recreational. Um, But like any substance, be it plant or not, uh, it comes with a series of risks. And uh, we're going to talk about those risks, we're going to talk about the benefits, we're going to talk about why and how it works, and in what ways people use it uh, in this episode. So hang on to your seats, we're going to talk about Kratom! Sorry, that was kind of lame, I'll I'll, I'll probably never do that again. Uh, Yeah, so... Thank you very much to the people who help make this show possible, my patrons on Patreon. Thank you. Uh, The people whose names are listed on the screen here uh, and in the description to this episode. Um, Big thanks to you. Uh, You are giving significantly, some of you, for a long time, so thank you. Um, If you are not yet a patron, please become one. It's very supportive. If you're not negatively impacted uh, by the pandemic uh, economically, it would be much appreciated to throw a couple dollars to the show, be it $2 or 23 plus dollars, which is how you get your name listed in the credits. Um, Anything is something and it all adds up to uh, providing me a sustainable income for continuing to put my work full time into the larger body of work I have around psychedelics, but in particular and in specific this podcast as I am a one man team here. So big thanks if you are not yet a patron and you want to become one big thanks. I I like it. Thank you. Um, That's how we all get to enjoy it is when people choose to voluntarily donate to the show. So if you'd like to do that, patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso. If you'd like to just donate one time, you can use PayPal. Links to these things are contained in the description to this episode. So check it out and uh, enjoy this episode with Dr. Oliver Grundman Grundman here on Adventures Through the Mind, uh, episode 121, all about Kratom. Okay, well, Dr. Oliver Grundman, welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. Thank you very much, James. It's my pleasure. So uh, we're here to talk about Kratom. Um, you were one of the authors on a recent study that came out of John, Johns Hopkins about um, sort of like the actual evidence, the data behind Kratom use in the United States, which will hopefully, although maybe not... Uh, maybe not necessarily become like the evidence by which evidence-based policies are, are implemented in the United States around the scheduling and the regulation of Kratom. I mean, I think we might be a little too hopeful uh, or too optimistic to think that that's the way things will go, but that's sort of the information that you've been bringing out. And so I've had you on the show, or I'm having you on the show now to basically talk all about Kratom, because Kratom is a very interesting plant and it's playing an interesting role in um, sort of like Western consumption right now. So maybe to start us off, we can get a sense of what is Kratom uh, in so like the general overview of what is Kratom. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on the show first and uh, uh, giving 
a little bit of a voice to where we currently stand on our scientific knowledge in regards to quantum. Um, just a brief correction, I was actually not uh, an author or a researcher on that particular Johns Hopkins study. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to take credit for something that I was not part of. <laughs> it, oh, was a, it was yes. a great study. <laughs> yeah, okay, now I remember why, because it was, it was through Albert, Albert Garcia who was on that paper who directed me towards you and you've had other papers on Kratom. So yes, thank you for that correction. Part of my mistake. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Credit where credit is due. But uh, uh, so, and, and it was a great study. It, it, it contributed definitely to our knowledge uh, about Kratom. Um, so uh, when we uh, when we talk about Kratom, uh, we we have to remember that it, uh, many of the plants that we today know about and use they have a traditional background um, and so does kratom uh, kratom has been used for uh, to our knowledge at least um, one or two centuries back in southeast asia um, and uh, the tree has been uh, named uh, by its latin name mitragina speciosa um, and it is in uh, the same family as uh, the coffee plant, uh, coffee shrub, um, in the family of the Rubiaceae. And it is uh, characteristically has relatively thick uh, leaves. Um, and uh, it wasn't originally discovered uh, because of its slightly stimulant effects. Um, and it has been used uh, uh, quite a bit in Thailand and uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, for uh, for both its uh, stimulant um, and its um, slightly sedative and pain relieving analgesic effects uh, for uh, a very long period of time. We don't know exactly how far it dates back its use, but um, uh, really for for a very long period of time there. Um, so um, I don't I don't want to. Uh, call myself necessarily the uh, all-knowing person on Kratom, but uh, I've got some collaborators in uh, Malaysia who uh, themselves have, have known Kratom and have studied Kratom from the very beginning, even before it really took off in the United States. So uh, they have had a perspective how it is still being used uh, traditionally and then a little bit into its its modern uses in uh, in in Southeast Asia, uh, and I think that both the traditional and the more modern applications of kratom uh, mirror kind of where it stands today uh, as a as a plant. And what is what is entirely used are the leaves, basically, uh, of the of the tree, um, and and what we think is uh, kind of um, related to its uh, stimulant uh, effects is its relationship to coffee, to the coffee family. Um, we don't know exactly if all of its effects are linked to particular ingredients that are currently being researched. And we can go into that as we explore that later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so before we go into the, the pharmacology of, of the plant, um, let's zoom in a little bit more on the history of it, because one of the things I think is important, if, if we're to understand, and, and maybe you agree with me here, if, if we're to understand where a plant um, can be used, where if we're to understand the role of a plant and its position within a modern society, then it makes sense to have an understanding of what was the cultural context of its use historically before we imported it to where we are, because it's a Southeast Asian plant. It's not from the United States. It doesn't even grow in the United States very well, like maybe in a greenhouse, perhaps. Um, and so I'd like to get a sense of the history uh, of the thing. What was its traditional use in Southeast Asia, and how has that traditional, how is its place in in Southeast Asia changed over time? Because I understand now it's only available as a prescription medicine um, in Thailand. And please correct me if that's incorrect. Yeah, so uh, certainly the both its its uses have expanded or changed over time. And also the legislation has changed over time. And I think uh, that has to be viewed both from uh, a perspective of um, how 
medicine has changed over time, as well as um, our understanding of a little bit of the politics, the local politics that play into that, as drug regulation is often tied to that. Um, so uh, in, in, in Southeast Asia, um, the plant was traditionally, and to this very day is still chewed by, um, the, the, the fresh leaves are chewed by day laborers, um, those who are really hardworking, sometimes have long uh, days uh, exposed to um, uh, to um, relatively hardworking conditions in, in the sun and tropical weather uh, for the, its stimulant effects. So they briefly chew on it and then they spit it out. Uh, it's it's not a very pleasant taste, it's relatively bitter, um, uh, and, and uh, that really provides provides basically the more ergogenic effects and and uh, kind of uh, keeping them um, um, stimulated throughout the day. Um, the other application is either using the fresh leaves or the dried leaves to prepare a uh, a tea or tea like preparation. Um, and and the, the the dried leaves can be ground up sometimes or at least uh, macerated, um, and then uh, basically let that uh, uh, let that cool or make, keep it warm, uh, and then drink it. And that is more for the uh, sedative or and, and and pain relieving analgesic effects. Now it has also been used uh, to reduce uh, fever and to treat diarrhea, for example. And, and that has kind of given a little bit of a hint of its potential uh, action uh, that, that some of the plant constituents may act on, on opioid uh, receptors. Uh, because of diarrhea, we use uh, certain opioids to treat diarrhea as well, um, uh, because it kind of um, opioids, when you, when you take them, cause constipation uh, if you don't have diarrhea. So to reduce diarrhea, you take opioids as well. So, but it has been used uh, traditionally for a wide range of, of different symptoms. Now, in the 1950s, 1960s, what happened in uh, Malaysia uh, is uh, that uh, a, 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 a large amount of people were using uh, kratom extracts um, or at least uh, a certain number of the population, a certain amount of the population was using um, kratom to uh, substitute for opioid uh, and for opium. Uh, and opium was in short supply at that point uh, for whatever reason, uh, or it, it was simply the prices were getting higher at that point in Malaysia. Uh, so kratom, because it was natively available, it was a native plant that you could just grow in your backyard and many people still grow it in their backyard. Um, uh, uh, they just picked the leaves and, and made basically their own kratom uh, decoction out of the leaves and used that instead. Now, the, uh, the Poisons Act of 1952 prohibited basically the use of kratom. They regulated it in, in Malaysia. And that is still uh, to this very day uh, in effect in Malaysia. In Thailand, we had a, a regulation uh, and basically a ban on, on kratom uh, and its preparations up until 2018, I believe. Uh, it might be 2019, I might be wrong on that. Um, and uh, that was changed uh, recently um, to basically allow the medical use of kratom preparations um, under the care of a, of a medical professional, under a healthcare professional. Uh, so we, we see some changes uh, in, in legislation. Um, it has been suspected or what has been written uh, about was that the the main concern or that there was some impact in Malaysia uh, basically threatening the opium trading um, by kratom substitution. So that kratom threatened basically the opium trades in Malaysia. And that's why 
legislation was introduced. So I, I cannot necessarily confirm that. I don't have a first-hand account or anything like that. Um, uh, but that was kind of the suspicion uh, that Kratom interfered with, with opium trade at the time. Uh, as far as Indonesia is concerned, Indonesia currently doesn't have a strict regulation on Kratom. Um, there is a, a certain um, rumor that it might actually prohibit uh, the agricultural uh, growth of Kratom. Uh, and also the export of Kratom to the United States in particular. And I don't know to what degree uh, that is uh, true or that will become uh, effective. I know that the American Kratom Association has been uh, working on that or has advertised or is informing its members that it might happen. Um, to my knowledge, most of the kratom that is imported into the United States or find its way into the, into the United States comes from Indonesia. And now a way around that has been actually through uh, Malaysia and Thailand so that Indonesia harvests and grows uh, the kratom and then actually exports it through Malaysia and Thailand and then they export it to the United States. Hmm, interesting. Um, stepping back a little bit, because I, I'm seeing uh, one of the things that you said there about um, how Kratom was possibly interrupting the sort of profit margin of the opium trade. To me, I, I'm wondering if there's an overlap with the scheduling of Kratom in the United States by the DEA and some of the sort of like big pharma influence around opioids. But before we go there, there's something that you said there about um the decocting of the of the fresh leaves or of the ground leaves and then drinking it is is this something that's happening where the actual leaf matter is being consumed as well because commonly and we'll talk about this afterwards too um, the leaf matter is directly consumed um, in the modern use of it here in in north america at least um, when those teas are being made are they is it just like the water and the, and the molecules in there, there, or is it like the whole leaf matter being consumed as well? So it is. It is a little bit of a slush material. Uh, it is. Uh, there is a very um, a very rudimentary filter process involved. A filtering process, um, uh, not unlike a little bit of a tea bag, um, but even with a tea bag, you get a little bit of a, you know, tea leaf reading kind of, uh, so there's a little bit of a, of a sediment that is left behind. Um, and it depends a little bit. Sometimes they don't even do that necessarily of filtering when it's sold. Um, today you buy these little plastic bags that contain, um, kratom, uh, tea basically that is brewed, that has been brewed and is then sold, um, on ice basically to, um, to consumers. Uh, that contains a little bit of a slush a residue, but that has been filtered. Traditionally, uh, people can choose to either uh, uh, ingest it uh, as a slush with the whole residue, with the whole sediment, or they can filter it. It, it really depends what they, what they prefer. Um, what we know to date is limited in regards to which compounds are really extracting well in a water extract because what really is, is ingested is is a water extract basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let, let's let's use that as the leverage point to talk a little bit about the pharmacology of the plant. Like it has a it has a variety of different alkaloids. I understand um, all of which seem to be related to a core alkal uh, alkaloid called um, mitragynine or something like that. Um, what is the far what is the pharmacology of the plant in the sense of what chemicals are in it, what is its constituents, and then what do we know about how it's affecting our brain when we consume it? Yeah, so that is, uh, uh, that is a very interesting uh, in regards to the core alkaloids that we know. We know that these are indole alkaloids. Um, so indole, the indole core structure uh, is preserved in um, some and endogenous molecules that we have that we produce ourselves. So, for example, serotonin as a neurotransmitter has an indole structure. 
Um, we have also a variety of other psychoactive substances that contain the indole structure. And I do not mean to at all uh, uh, put uh, mitragynin and the other indole alkaloids that are present in, um, uh, in kratom on, on the same level with uh, some of these other indole ring containing alkaloids. Sure, uh, like but, psilocybin, uh, for example. Like yeah. psilocybin or LSD as a semi-synthetic, uh, but uh, they contain the same structure. Uh, however, they seem to have very different uh, activities when it comes to which uh, receptors they target in the body and, and what the resulting effects are. Uh, so when we talk about the two major alkaloids that have been studied, and we, we know at least uh, structurally from, from their structure, we know at least 40 of them. So uh, we currently mainly talk about two that are uh, studied, but there might be much more uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, quantum uh, that we simply do not investigate at the moment very well. But the two that are studied are mitragynin and 7-hydroxymitragynin. Uh, uh, and mitragynin is primarily studied because it's the main alkaloid that is present in uh, the, the, the leaf uh, material. Um, so mitragynin, what, what most people are focusing on is its activity at opioid receptors. Um, and when, we, when, we, when I say activity at opioid receptors, is, I mean it interacts with opioid receptors, it binds to opioid receptors, um, and it acts as a what we call a partial agonist. And partial agonist means that it doesn't activate all of the opioid receptors it actually binds to. Um, so it, it activates some of them. It doesn't activate all of them. So the best comparison, if anybody would make a comparison, and I, it's, it's kind of a little bit, it's, it doesn't fit very well, but uh, is buprenorphine, which is also, it's a, it's a syn synthetic opioid um, that we use often in the treatment um, of opioid withdrawal um, to, to maintain people who are on opioid maintenance therapy um, and uh, that is also a partial agonist at opioid receptors. The big difference uh, that distinguishes mitragynin from uh, the opioids like morphine or heroin or uh, even oxycodone, hydrocodone, Percocet and Vicodin, you know, all of these brand names when I talk about just those um, is what happens after they actually bind to the opioid receptors. So the opioid receptors, when we imagine a cell, let's think biology for a second, um, our biology high school classes, uh, we, we have the cell with the cell wall and uh, the opioid receptors sit in the cell wall basically. And on the outside, uh, um, we have the, the binding side where where our little mitragynin molecule binds to, or our morphine molecule binds to. And then on the inside of the cell wall, uh, there's actually a, a little three-part kind of little trigger or a little switch. Uh, and that little switch is called a G protein. So that little G protein um, basically causes a little cascade of uh, like a domino effect that happens after the receptor is activated. That switch turns on, and then this little domino cascade is activated um, upon the receptor being activated. But there's also a secondary cascade that actually happens that most people might not be aware of, and I wasn't aware of it until I learned more about mitragynin and uh, these particular alkaloids, and that is the arrestin, beta arrestin 2 pathway. Um, and the beta arrestin 2 pathway uh, is responsible, it's also another domino effect happens after that one is activated. 
Uh, and, and that actually leads to some of the not so beneficial uh, effects that we often attribute to opioids. So the G protein coupled pathway that I mentioned, the domino effects from there down, uh, leads to the pain relieving effects um, that we want to see, that we want to get out of it. Uh, but the beta arrestin pathway uh, can lead to some of the not so beneficial effects like the respiratory depression, for example. Uh, so slowed breathing that people experience that often leads to these uh, overdose um, incidences where that can also lead to death in some cases, unfortunately. Um, so what is the important distinction is when morphine or oxycodone, hydrocodone, um, bind to the opioid receptors, um, then they activate both the G protein receptor cascade and the beta arrestin 2 cascade. When uh, mitragynin binds, what has been confirmed in multiple studies by independent groups so far is that only the G protein coupled pathway is activated, not the beta arrestin 2 pathway. So that's an important distinction. We can, if you just basically look at, um, does it bind to the beta opioid, uh, does it bind to the opioid receptors a molecule? You can study that in a, um, we now have very sophisticated programs that can do that. So you can study that on a computer. You don't ever have to actually go into, uh, into an animal or even into a, a, a cell study you can do that, and the computer will tell you, yes, it binds to the opioid receptor, but it doesn't actually, the computer cannot tell you what happens afterwards, after it binds. Does it activate both the G protein and the beta arrestin 2 pathway? We're not there yet that we can predict which particular uh, downstream, we call that downstream effects, are mediated um, after binding of, of, of a particular molecule to uh, a receptor. Hmm. So it, what I'm understanding here is that there's something unique about the alkaloids in kratom that bind to opioid receptors providing um, analgesic effects and, and, other, and other effects, euphoria and all the rest, but that it, it doesn't suppress the breathing. So it, it sort of like provides some level of opioid activity without one of the primary dangers that's associated with acute use. That is, that is correct. Yes. That's, that's basically what studies have found so far for mitragynin for seven hydroxy mitragynin. We see that it is a little bit different. Um, we are not certain what the exact mechanism is, but what has been shown in animal studies is uh, that while mitragynin is not a reinforcer, so uh, if you give morphine, if you give an animal a choice, <clears throat> if they want to self-administer morphine repeatedly, they will do so. So uh, basically they have a choice of a water bottle and a choice of, of, of morphine injection or saline injection and, and morphine injection, they will tap the lever that injects morphine, uh, injects morphine. Uh, if you give them a choice of doing mitragynin, they will not repeatedly tap the mitragynin lever. They will not do that. With 7-hydroxymitragynin, they will do the same as they do with morphine. So there is a potential for tolerance and dependence development with 7-hydroxymitragynin, which we do not see with mitragynin. Um, and we do not know exactly why that is, because uh, it doesn't look like 7-hydroxymitragynin is also activating the beta arrestin 2 domino pathway, the, that pathway that uh, is activated uh, once it binds to the opioid receptors. And that would also be a, a bad effect of many of the opioids that they cause that tolerance and dependence development. So is something about 7 hydroxymitragynin that we do not fully understand yet. So so the so the 7 hydroxy variety is able to does doesn't activate that that beta 
beta arrestin two pathway. Was that correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that the activation of that pathway in other opioids is primarily what's a, what um, is associated to its dependency, but they both create dependency. Yes. So seven hydroxymetragynin also has been shown in animal studies to create uh, tolerance and dependency development, but it doesn't seem to be mediated through the beta arrestin two pathway. Yes. Hmm, interesting. Um, so, oh, there's two questions. Okay, I'm going to start with this first question, and then I have another one specifically about what you're talking about. When it's activating the the opioid receptors, now I understand that there's there's three. Is there three different kinds of opioid receptors? One of them's kappa. One of them's mu. And I the the third one is. Delta. Delta. Um, and primarily heroin, morphine, all the rest. It activates with mu, wherein something like salvinorin A from salvia seems to exclusively ap- activate kappa opioid receptors. Do we have a sense of which opioid receptors are being activated specifically with uh, with kratom? So um, I cannot talk for, for all of kratom. That's the problem because we primarily look at mitragynin right, uh, right. and 7-hydroxymitragynin. So uh, for mitragynin, we know that it primarily targets uh, the mu opioid receptors. Um, and then it is a, um, the ooh, I don't want to get this wrong, but it is also a, an agonist at the kappa opioid receptors and I believe an antagonist at the delta opioid receptors. Uh, whereas seven hydroxymetragynin is also an agonist at the mu opioid receptors, but then an antagonist at the kappa and the delta opioid receptors. Hmm. So what what is the role of the of the delta um, and the the antagonism there? Like, is there is there something unique about it being an antagonist to delta, and and also an explanation as to what the delta receptor is sort of associated with? So uh, we primarily focus when we focus on the analgesic effects on the mu opioid receptor. That's always has been our primary target. And we are trying to hone in on a selective mu opioid receptor agonist to target um, analgesic effects. Uh, So ideally, we don't want even a molecule to target the kappa and the delta opioid receptors. We want to stay clear of them just because we, in some cases, we don't even necessarily uh, understand, or I don't want to say understand, but some of the effects uh, linked to kappa opioid receptors in, in particular um, are, uh, when you talk about salvinorin A, for example, uh, seem to be uh, strong hallucinations, for example, um, and uh, sometimes psychosis development. So uh, we want to stay clear of that. Uh, with the delta opioid receptor, uh, we we do not have the best understanding of its role. Um, we know it's it has some analgesic properties as well when it's being activated, uh, but we do know that it also plays a role in tolerance and dependence development. So we want to stay clear of that as well if we can. Uh, so that's our current understanding. Um, we have particular animal models where we can use drugs to target each of these receptors specifically, but they cannot be used in humans. Uh, so I would I would have to actually look into that a little bit more to give you a more precise answer. To be honest, <laughs> mm. I'm sure there's like a whole there's a whole swatch of people out there that if you gave them access to a, a delta prim- like a primarily or an exclusively delta opioid. Uh, agonists that they would sample it and give you a trip report on Arrowhead uh, if the opportunity emerged for them. Um, and and God bless those people because like there's a lot of good exploration and, and data that's coming out of that. Um, although I don't expect you as a, as a scientist to condone uh, that type of behavior. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so the next question that I had had to do with dependence. Now, I have had previously uh, conversations with a friend of mine who's also um, pretty deep in um, treating opioid uh, dependency um, with ibogaine, um, or he was anyways, he was very deep. Now he is a the chair for MAPS Canada. His name's Trevor Miller. And uh, he was talking about how one of the consequences of opioid dependence is that the body no longer produces its own opioids 
so that when you start to come off of it, then all of a sudden, even just standing, even the force of gravity inflicts pain on the body. Is something similar present? Like, what is the degree of dependence that can emerge with um, with kratom use? Now, I know you, you won't be able to talk pharmacologically about this. You'd have to dip into maybe case reports or whatever, because usually outside of the research, it's all of kratom, you know, like the whole plant rather than the, the extracted alkaloids. But do we have a sense of what's happening um, with the dependence and the withdrawal from kratom in that sense? So, uh, yeah, you're exactly right. So outside of case reports, we don't really have a lot of data on um, even what the particular symptoms are with uh, kratom withdrawal and um, uh, dependence development. So um, let me uh, take you a step back. Um, a majority of people who take kratom uh, will not develop tolerance or dependence to it. Um, there are, I, at the moment, from what I've seen in the literature, we might have had um, from reports that have been reported in the literature, we um, might have had maybe five, five to ten cases, case reports of uh, dependence development. Out of, out of how many? Is, out of how many? Because five to ten out of fifteen is like a pretty high amount, you know. But five to ten out of hundreds or thousands—that's that's that's different. Well, so we don't. Well, the, the the problem is we don't know exactly. These are reported cases uh, out of, you know, we don't even know how many users there are exactly uh, who are using Kratom. The estimate ranges from five. That are the number of uh, active American Kratom Association. Uh, members uh, to when we look at Kratom import volume um, based on Indonesian exports. So, you know, these are all very, very, uh, very loose uh, estimates. Uh, then we can go as high as 16 million people that are using Kratom in the United States. Um, and, and case reports are just the ones that are actually reported in the literature. Oh, okay. out of yes, I the understand. ones yeah. that are being, you know, potentially treated and don't make it into the literature. Right. So, so I had the misunderstanding that you were talking about, uh, like a study that looked at all the reported use of credit, but you're talking about specifically medical case reports of people coming in and they're having adverse effects with Kratom. Correct. Okay, yeah. So uh, those that, that, yeah, th those that are actually where somebody was going through Kratom withdrawal and then they were treated with, for example, buprenorphine or naloxone or something like that, Narcan. Um, so the, from, from the presentation, case presentation, they range anywhere from uh, descriptions of uh, withdrawal symptoms that are like opioids, uh, where uh, they are presenting with pain, they are presenting with um, uh, withdrawal symptoms uh, like uh, constipation and uh, 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 mood uh, swings and and, and um, all the way to somebody who actually presented with a seizure uh, because he was on, I guess, something like acute withdrawal from Kratom. Um, but then there are also milder cases uh, where somebody was basically having craving uh, for Kratom and was having concerns that he might have become dependent on it um, and was increasing his dose over time with Kratom. And uh, the, then the doctor was, or the, the, the physician was saying, okay, you are dependent on it. I want to switch you to buprenorphine in this case. Um, so, it's a very wide range. I, I, so it's very hard to tell what are the exact withdrawal symptoms. I would assume that similar to opioids where you can also have a wide range of withdrawal symptoms, uh, where depending on what, what the dose actually was, where somebody stands and when they decide I've become dependent and I want to withdraw from it, um, uh, that 
uh, you then have to take appropriate action. If somebody is in acute withdrawal and they see seizing up uh, or uh, they are yeah, basically seizing up, they really have very severe symptoms, then Loxone uh, and benzodiazepines would be the way to go. Um, now I'm talking very medical, I'm sorry. Uh, but um, if it's if it's really like somebody is worried that they are developing a, a tolerance, they're increasing their dose, um, and and then they uh, they develop a dependence, and then they talk to their to their doctor, then maybe it's buprenorphine or methadone are are the course of action to take. Um, for me, it's always a question of uh, if you put somebody on maintenance with buprenorphine or methadone. Um, Yes, these are approved, and I understand um, that these are probably the, the best course of action. This is currently best practice, but you're basically switching somebody from one opioid to another opioid in this case. Well, you're also you're, you're taking them from, I mean, okay, this is, this is a fallacy. This is a naturalistic fallacy, and I understand that, but you're taking them from you know, a, a plant that they're taking you know, that has limited negative adverse effects, and you're putting them onto something that like reports of people who go on to methadone is like, you never come off methadone once you're on it. It's, it's, it's so difficult to detox from and, and so pervasive in a person's life once they're on it, it becomes the new sort of like, it becomes the new addiction. Um, like this is in some of the research and understanding I've had of watching people try to come off of heroin, come off of naloxone and oh, sorry, not naloxone, excuse me. Um, suboxone or methadone and stuff that it's almost it's it's easier to detox from morphine than it is to detox from methadone so it's it's also like it's sort of a weird sort of backwards way i think um inside of like medical best practices to take somebody off of something like kratom and put them onto methadone which they're now on likely for the rest of their lives um so that's it i, I mean i'm not asking you to comment on it you could but it to me it just seems like a it seems very much like a strange backward way of approaching the issue. Well, yeah, I, I think one, one issue is that uh, the physician or the, 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 the treatment that is currently best practice is it's, it's potentially covered by insurance. So that's one benefit. Uh, the other one is that they are basically following uh, medical best practices and therefore they are uh, there to, um, to do no harm and currently kratom is unregulated basically there's the fda says there's no medical indication for it and uh, therefore they are following to some degree their oath uh, to do no harm and if somebody's taking an unregulated product uh, then there is potential for harm and uh, so i can understand that the physician is going down that route uh, it's not necessarily that i um, disagree with you that yes, we are potentially exposing somebody to um, a fate uh, that they are going to be on on this drug for the rest of their life. Um, uh, it's a so when we talk about drug addiction in general, and I realize we're going into a philosophical discussion now, but um, drug addiction is no matter if you are still taking the drug or if you are. Uh, maintaining withdrawal or you're maintaining abstinence, it is a lifelong disorder. Uh, so I think that is something that we as uh, potentially um, somebody who has never had a, a drug addiction or a drug dependence or a substance use disorder uh, sometimes don't understand. Um, I think that's that's something that we have to realize. Uh, but this is unrelated. It's a different topic from Kratom. <laughs> right. And, and also, I think it's important um, for myself in having explored this topic quite deeply. It's obviously very relevant um, to the show here with psychedelics and psychedelic treatment. Okay, Ibogaine connects with that. So then Ibogaine now connects with opioid addiction. But then also um, just my podcast is generally sort of like hashtag drug positive. Let's talk about all of it and let's talk about it reasonably and evidence-based and without shame and whatever else, right? So um, that in all of that, there's there's like a real clear difference maybe to be had. They overlap they conf and they're often conflated, but the difference between being like physiologically dependent on a substance and being addicted to a substance, because I don't think people are addicted to methadone. 
they're dependent on methadone. It's not like they wake up every day and they're like, oh yeah, I really got to get my methadone. Like I need it, you know, because it's, it's fixing a deep emotional wound. I'm trying to escape pain, blah, blah, blah. But there's like a dependence. It's like physically I do need it. It's not, you know, like it's, it's like neurobiologically, physiologically, they need that to actually face the world where addiction can be pervasive in ways that don't, have physiological dependence like I could have a severe addiction to shopping and I could have a severe addiction to television watching or sex these things I can have addictions to and of course there's physiological components but I'm not physiologically dependent on those things so it's like I, I I'm not asking you to like I'm just bringing in this consideration of like being able to differentiate between the two although they're often very very overlapped um, like with addiction and, and dependence. And then also, you know, what causes addiction is a whole different story that like, why do we become addicted to things? And in this sense, I, I lean into Gabor Mate and his, his sort of encapsulated, encapsulates it, but like addiction is essentially like a solution that we have come up with to solve the problem of pain. It's just not a good solution and usually just creates more pain in the long run and his thing is like not why the addiction but why the pain and then that goes back into trauma and life context and and that of course would expand into larger like socioeconomic factors and all the rest which is related to but not necessarily the same as being physiological physiologically dependent to a substance oh yeah and that's why i think that uh just uh, treating a uh, in uh, a dependence uh, or a, uh, a, a substance use disorder just with pharmacotherapy um, is not going to be a solution. We need uh, always a, a helping hand um, uh, like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or something to, uh, to uh, help us to, to actually uh, uh, clear the path to to dig deeper what is the underlying cause of what led us to uh, to pursue this behavioral pattern that that got us into this position because i think there's underlying behaviors tied to it as as you said that actually in the first place um got somebody to establish this this new routine that established this new uh, thought process uh, potentially or this new behavior that then connected them to, and, and I agree, that's that's what I tell um, learners in my classes as well, uh, that uh, it's not only a, a sub, we, we obviously talk often about substance use disorders, but it can be other things as well. As you said, you can be addicted to gambling, you can be addicted to shopping, you can be addicted to sex, to food. I mean, when we think about our pleasures that we enjoy or look forward to, sometimes we reward ourselves with food all the time. Uh, I, I know that I have a sweet tooth and it's just how it is. We both reward Anyways. ourselves with food and we use food to suppress pain, um, which are, mm. you know, to, to like, they're obviously very, very related. And on top of having something like CBT or DBT or ACT or whatever it is to like help someone psychologically come to recognize like, what is the root of these behaviors and, and how to, like be aware of the mind working so as to sort of catch certain behaviors at different times to sort of, you know, realign over time. There's also um, a consideration of how socioeconomic factors are influencing those behaviors too. Because it's like, it's all well and good if I've got like the CBT capacity to realize that I'm just responding out of, uh, responding to a pain and desperate, an emotional pain of desperation that's present in my body by reaching to heroin, that's all fine and good. But if my desperation, my emotional, psychological desperation is because I'm trapped up in a system, like a, a, like a social system that does not have any uh, support structures or institutions to help me get out of the economic situation that I'm in, then what the hell good is any of that? Because I can't go anywhere or do anything. I'm still just like stuck in the same thing like stuck in the same pattern, you know? So it's like, well, it's all great that you have CBT and recognize the dependence and blah, blah, blah. But if you're still living on the street, then, and there's no options for you to get a job or get an app because you don't have an address and you can't get an address because you don't have a job and there's no support structures to get you there, then it kind of leaves people trapped in that. 
I, I completely agree. And uh, uh, certainly the way that this is sometimes handled uh, is uh, uh, we we should rethink our our process our our whole approach to uh, thinking about substance use disorders um, as a society um, and and we have seen that other countries have have made progress um, when we think about Portugal uh, for example as as one example um, especially when it comes to incarceration uh, policies when it comes to um, also. Uh, treating somebody with a substance use disorder or um, uh, to 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 maintain them integrated in society and not shun them out to uh, actually provide them with um, a, a network uh, that stabilizes them uh, because we, we know from various uh, approaches the Vietnam War was probably the, the greatest example where people who went to Vietnam and were exposed to heroin or opium. Um, a majority of those people who were exposed to um, to loop it back a little bit to 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 our topic um, uh, that were taking um, uh, heroin back back there, where it was cheap and it was affordable to take and, and readily available. Um, they we, we we thought that we had a huge uh, crisis on our hands that soldiers soldiers were coming back and uh, we would have thousands of folks addicted to uh, to heroin but they were coming back and they were going back into their families into their usual social settings and they were not staying um on the drug uh, because they were socially integrated they were socially in their usual settings and um, i think that's a huge component especially when we do drug research in socially isolated animals uh, we see the same behavior that they rather uh, choose to stay they choose other activities when they are within their their social setting when they have other animals around them rats uh, for example uh, they like to uh, engage in other they like to play they like to have sex they like to interact with other rats uh, social engagement um, rather than just, you know, inject themselves or uh, expose themselves to drugs. So I think that's a, that makes a huge difference when we have this social equalizer um, where, where people feel integrated, they part of a, a larger social structure instead of having social inequalities, social factors as you, uh, social, socioeconomic uh, factors that you, that you pointed out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, it's, and, and I like the way that you pointed out, um, like the, the value of as, as a policy to look at substance use as, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm inferring what you were saying here, but to look at substance use as a health issue or a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, a social, a social health issue rather than a criminal issue. Um, now, crime is often associated with people who are deeply addicted and in socioeconomic situations where they don't, they're not able to sustain the economic resources that they need to get their substances. Um, but that there's like a big difference in how we handle as a society um, addiction between a health crisis, like a social health care issue and a criminal issue, because one comes with punishment and the other one comes with acknowledgement hopefully acknowledgement, compassion and support, which even in just discussing what I think, what's it called the environmental enrichment for uh, like rats and they end up not wanting to use the substances and blah, 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 um, that that is going to help people get off addiction. And then if they're off addiction, then all the crime stuff kind of resolves itself because they're no longer committing crimes to, to feed the addiction, where if you just respond it with criminally, Sure, you increase the sort of larger revenue of the of the private um, prison industrial complex in the United States, for example, but you're not exactly creating safer communities by any means. You're just moving the dangers elsewhere and then profiting off it, and then those dangers eventually come back into the community because those people get released and they're not necessarily rehabilitated. So, um, yeah, larger social larger social stuff that was not the intention. So maybe we'll slide back off this, this, <laughs> this wonderful, but nonetheless tangent uh, topic um, and go back into why let's, let's go into why people use Crowder because it is related um, because generally from what I understand, there's different ways of 
people get into Kratom. One of which is, and I, I personally feel like any of these reasons are, are fair enough reasons. Um, recreationally, because it can be a good time. Um, as far as like, as a means to get off of opiates, uh, pharmaceutical opiates. I've known people who have taken themselves off being prescribed Percocets and all the rest by switching over to Kratom. So in, in the research, what do we know about why people use Kratom? Yeah, so that was uh, kind of my initial, actually, curiosity, what got me into Kratom. Um, I'm, uh, interestingly enough, I'm usually not a survey person. Uh, my, my original research was really in the neuropharmacology of natural products. So I was more of a lab person, but um, Kratom, uh, in, back in 2000. 16, I'm only thinking four years back, uh, was kind of just starting to really uh, become a, a thing in the scientific community in the United States and has really taken quite off in, in these past four years. Um, so uh, what I did in 2015, that's when I first became aware of it, uh, was through one of my, excuse me, my graduate students. Uh, who uh, is in law enforcement in South Florida and, and um, mentioned to me uh, that he had an interesting case of a young uh, uh, young man who um, uh, post-mortem uh, actually was reported to have Kratom in a system, not Kratom, but Mitragynin, basically. And uh, they couldn't do anything with the data at the time. It wasn't necessarily they couldn't say if if his death could be attributed to kratom exposure um was inconclusive and i got interested in it uh, because i never heard of it uh, so uh, i was looking through the literature and there was no report really of um who uh, when and for what reason people in the united states uh, were using kratom so i conducted a survey in 2016 um and uh, it was very well. I'm really thankful for everybody who participated uh, because it really was kind of uh, the first larger anonymous survey in the United States. Um, and uh, I, I was just looking for four general categories. And um, uh, since then, we have had more surveys that kind of, uh, to varying degrees, confirmed uh, that people primarily use it uh, for the self-treatment of acute or chronic pain. And that obviously aligns well with uh, what it is used for traditionally as well in Southeast Asia, when you take a, 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 a dried extract and you, you either cook it or you prepare it in a, in a, in a water solution and then you, you drink it. Uh, that's exactly what it's used for. Uh, we had a uh, a smaller set of folks who were using it uh, to self-treat or, or mitigate the withdrawal symptoms from uh, illicit drugs. Uh, so that could have been opioids, um, that could have been um, uh, stimulants, any other drug uh, that they wanted to get off uh, from. Uh, then we had another subset of folks who responded that they used it to specifically mitigate the withdrawal symptoms from a prescription opioid. And that was actually a larger set um, than the folks who were using it to get off from an illicit drug. Uh, and then another large number of folks were using it to self-treat um, what I called classified as an emotional or mental conditions. So for example, depression, anxiety uh, uh, disorders, uh, or uh, PTSD, uh, something along those lines. And that was also a, a quite a large portion of, of respondents. Um, so that kind of, uh, and that was confirmed, so for example, in the Johns Hopkins study that you, um, that you mentioned at the very beginning, it was kind of confirmed in, in many other studies that that was really the the larger portion of folks who who are using kratom for for those purposes, simply in the self treatment of pain and uh, an emotional or or mental condition. Um, 
um, so so the the fraction of people who are using it for mitigation of withdrawal symptoms from an illicit drug or from an opioid prescription from a prescription opioid was smaller. Uh, what uh, a uh, uh, another person. Um, Kirsten Smith did, uh, who I work now with actually a little bit, we collaborate on some some projects, is she looked at a subset of um, uh, people who are using uh, drugs, um, uh, substances, and she asked them, would you rather prefer to substitute your drug with Kratom? Um, and a majority of people do not prefer to get high on Kratom versus their preferred drug of choice, no matter if that's a an opioid, if that's a stimulant or alike. If they have been prior to using Kratom or just trying out Kratom, been using an opioid or a stimulant or another uh, psychoactive substance, uh, Kratom was not a good substitute for that. Uh, so if they wanted to get the same uh, exposure, the same experience, um, the same high, so to say, Kratom was not a good substitute for that. It seemed to help with mitigating the withdrawal symptoms to some degree, but it's not a good substitute for an opioid or for a stimulant. Hmm. Um, for in people who are already with a dependence or a substance use um, disorder for something more intense um but it could be perhaps uh, given that people are also self-administering it for anywhere from depression to chronic pain that it could be as effective for the daily use of a person um, with these types of disorders as might be a more intense pharmaceutical substance so uh in in that first survey that uh i conducted in 2016 we asked folks how did your pain uh, level on a, on a slider scale um, change uh, and how did your overall health change after the use of Kratom and really for a, a large majority of folks who used Kratom um, their pain and their overall health uh, improved uh, quite a bit with the use of Kratom so that tells me that um, yes uh, Kratom is helping those people um, I do not know what kind of medications they used prior to using Kratom. Um, some people may be afraid to actually even use opioids because of the potential for tolerance and dependence development. Um, but um, we see that Kratom seems to help quite a few folks who uh, who present with, with such such symptoms or such disorders. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so let's talk about adverse effects because we had talked earlier. I mean, one obvious adverse effect is you could get addicted to it. Like you could become physiologically dependent on the substance. And I actually had someone, I had made a post about having Kratom as a, as a part of my life. And I had gotten somebody else that had said to me that they were felt like they were in a bit of trouble because they were using Kratom um, and they were using it based on this, oh, it's okay because it's natural, blah, 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 this misunderstanding. And then all of a sudden they need 10 grams a day or they feel like they're falling apart, right? And it just sort of crept up on them and they didn't think about it because it was no big deal. As, similarly, in some sense, maybe as people who don't really seem to think coffee is a big deal and then they're eating, drinking six, seven, eight cups a day. And if they don't get at least five, then they feel like shit and they treat other people like shit. Um, but, you know, coming off of coffee, although painful, maybe is less intense than coming off of something that has an opioid um, effect in the body. But we have this potential danger of addiction or excuse me, physiological dependence. What are the other adverse effects that are present for um, Kratom that we know of, either acutely, um, since you said it doesn't tend to suppress the respiratory system, um, or chronically? So what has been reported in the literature and what we have seen is uh, classical. Uh, uh, so for one, it's, it's, it's a dose-dependent adverse effect profile that we see. Um, we see constipation 
as uh, as one of the primary and most reported uh, adverse effects, uh, which you can expect from an opioid uh, or from something that acts on opioid receptors. Uh, we see nausea and vomiting um, uh, that can occur, primarily nausea, not so much vomiting. The issue with um, ingesting or drinking the actual uh, extract, if you just have the powder and you drink it, uh, some people use honey or something for preparing tea. Yeah orange juice, yeah. anything that makes it a little bit more palatable because it is rather bitter if you drink it and it's not it's not very well tasting. Uh, so that can cause just nausea uh, potentially. And there's just a limit of how much you can drink at a time without uh, having really a, a very uh, bad stomach experience. Stomach upset was also a common adverse effect. Um, I guess when you take it in pill form, um, you avoid those effects, uh, those adverse effects to some degree. Um, uh, then what is a little bit more serious are potential effects on the liver uh, that have been reported um, after a few days of ingestion. Uh, so that can occur within five to 10 days. Uh, depending a little bit, that's what I've seen in the literature. F five, These... Let's let me let's zoom in on that before you continue, because this is sort of like kind of hot. I mean, it kind of comes and goes, but it's sort of hot right now because there was recently a report that came out from, uh, you know, like a, a big organization that talks about liver toxicity of different substances and stuff and liver health, and they were suggesting that um, that oh, there's I think one of the one of the headlines I saw, which headlines don't mean shit, um, but was, you know, like this association is sounding the alarm on Kratom. Um, and then when I sent you that report, I mean, you said something like, this is a very interesting use of data. So are we talking like people who take Kratom every day for five to 10 days in a row at, at you know, we'll say maybe five or something grams, usually common is about five to eight grams at a higher dose for people, that that causes liver problems? Or is it more complex than that? Is it everybody? Is it some people? Is the reports like, do we know definitively it was Kratom? Is there some sort of genetic predisposition? What do we know? Like, what is what is like the, the reasonable assessment of danger around liver toxicity with Kratom? So um, when we talk about uh, causation, um, something being causative, something uh, being the reason that something else happens. So kratom being the reason that we have uh, a liver toxicity. Um, we stand on, currently we don't stand on very solid ground. Um, yes, we can say that kratom in some cases may contribute to liver, um, a toxicity to liver adverse effects. In the report that you sent me, and that's what I'm analyzing now. There are more reports in the literature, but let me just focus on that one as an example for now. Uh, there were seven reports of liver toxicity that were specifically discussed in that one. Six of them uh, also used alcohol. Um, so alcohol is a known liver toxicant. Uh, so if you combine that with Kratom, there were also no other reports of what other medications were these patients potentially on. So if we throw in something else like a benzodiazepine or uh, something like acetaminophen, something like Tylenol, that is also liver toxic, um, what are additive effects like? Uh, so we have a lot of different uh, factors that can play into that. Now, I don't, I don't want to downplay that some people may be at higher risk of developing liver toxicity with the use, with the high use of kratom, with high doses of kratom, and they should be careful with using kratom. Uh, they might want to consider um, consulting with a healthcare professional um, or at least checking if 
not to use uh, other uh, potential liver toxicants such as alcohol um, or acetaminophen if you use it for pain, for example, and you're also using ibuprofen or acetaminophen in conjunction with kratom, then you might be at an increased risk of developing liver toxicity. So you have a lot of factors that can play into that. Um, in addition, and that's another point that I sometimes like to harp on together, but I, I, I feel like we have been harping on that as uh, not only as researchers, but also as just, I want to say caring individuals, but I, I, uh, maybe I'm, I'm, uh, the, the, the issue currently is that since the FDA is saying Kratom is no good, we want it gone basically entirely that we don't have any regulation really regarding what Kratom products are entering the United States. So we don't have really any quality control of what consumers have access to. And therefore, there might be Kratom products out there that contain pesticides, that contain anything, heavy metals uh, that uh, might actually not be healthy, that might be uh, really not good. So if we had better regulations in place where we have some kind of uh, just uh, uh, where, where consumers knew that they had a good quality Kratom product that they have access to with some kind of labeling guideline and um, some kind of at least internal lab check um, that we know that good manufacturing practices are followed, then we might have had a, a better chance to at least reduce the number of, of, of Kratom um, uh, associated uh, liver uh, incidences. Now, if you compare these seven cases to the annual cases of Tylenol-related liver toxicity, um, I don't know if I can display that in, in a graph, <laughs> but it's like minuscule. It's, it's really nothing. Now, I don't want to downplay these six or seven cases, though, because everybody who obviously has adverse effects uh, so we need to be careful. We need to be aware of that. And and uh, everybody who uh, intends to use Kratom should always look at their current medication that they're taking and, and should be aware of potential drug interactions. Hmm. So, so what you're saying here is there is absolutely evidence and reason to be cautious around liver toxicity with Kratom, although it is not as uh, it is not a, oh, my God, Kratom causes liver damage scenario the way that it's being presented in the report that I sent you, where it's, you know, sounding the alarm on Kratom. So not, I, I if everybody who was using Kratom would have uh, elevated liver uh, enzyme values, as was reported in this case, um, then I would definitely say stay away from Kratom. Uh, I would not, not be, uh, Kratom would, I don't think that we would have five to 16 million somewhere uh, in that range of Kratom users in the United States. Uh, so if you are taking Kratom in reasonable doses, um, three to five grams, five to eight is already on the high end, to be honest, uh, three to five grams uh, per dose, uh, three doses per day. Um, and you, you have a good um, Kratom product uh, that meets kind of the current labeling guidelines that have been put forward by the American Kratom Association, um, then I, I would say that you are probably doing the best you can uh, and you keep in mind potential drug interactions with other drugs that can affect your liver, then you're probably doing the best you can at the moment to avoid liver toxicity. I'm not excluding it entirely, but uh, you're probably doing the best that you can. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the um, like the percentage difference between five to seven cases out of fifteen to or five to sixteen million people taking kratom, um, and how significant that is. Although when I started doing further research, there definitely was multiple reports online of people having uh, liver issues. Although one person um, I, they had expressed they had some sort of credentials to make this statement had exp had said it had something to do with a genetic predisposition towards how well you detox in your liver or, or 
with Kratom specifically and and that all the reports that had been discussed um, on the on like Reddits and stuff um, said that, OK, this is what happens after yeah five, five to 10 days. Urine gets very yellow. You start to develop jaundice and there's these other effects and that that every case that had been talked about was like as soon as Kratom was discontinued, all those all those effects went away and they went back to normal that it wasn't permanent effect as long as those things were noticed and like Kratom use was stopped immediately. Um, do you have any more information on that or is that sort of like what we know? That, that is our current knowledge, yes. Uh, now, uh, if, if it's only the liver toxicity, if that is the only occurring symptom, like you said, yonders, um, then discontinuation is obviously the path to go. Um, and, and if uh, I would still advise to consult with a healthcare provider because there might be other issues associated with that. Um, it might not be the kratom. It might be something else that's going on. So um, it's always good to to seek out um, a healthcare provider in, in such situations. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we were talking about adverse effects. Um, and I am curious if you have more to add before I ask you specifically about what does and does not um, sort of count as I think what the recent study from John Johns Hopkins said was a kratom use disorder. Is there any other adverse effects you want to mention before we go on to that topic? So uh, there have been a few reports of uh, particularly um, uh, lung uh, edema, uh, acute lung edema uh, that have been attributed to uh, potentially uh, high metragynin levels post-mortem. Uh, so uh, we don't know if that is um, kratom specific. Um, uh, I, I don't want to lean myself out of the window here, uh, but um, it might be something related to the cardiovascular system. So it might have something to do with heart. Um, people might be predisposed if they use kratom in very high amounts, well, well above eight grams uh, per dose. Um, uh, if they use it over a long period of time that they may develop uh, cardiovascular issues, so something with the heart, something with blood pressure, um, that then might extend to particularly uh, the lungs, um, and um, that, but it has only been shown in isolated cases so far. Uh, so that that is something that I have um, seen. It has been reported in, I believe, four cases to date, uh, post mortem. So. Um, um, where uh, mitragynin was detected in the blood uh, of deceased people. Hmm. Interesting. A any was that the last? Was that the last one that you wanted to that talk was, about? I, but there are certainly others, but those were the ones that were standing out to me um, that people sh I think should be aware of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are two questions here. I'll, st I'll start. I'll start with this one. Okay. So. One of the things that uh, was in the new Johns Hopkins study was talking about um, use of kratom and then a percentage of um, of how much of that use cat was categorized as um, as like kratom use disorder, which I guess is kratom specific substance use disorder, and that the percentage of people using it that develop this are slightly higher by like one or two percent. Um, but generally on par with the amount of people who end up with substance use disorder from the use of uh, prescribed um, opiates. And so my question there um, is, what is, what, what, at what point does it become substance use disorder? Because I, I, I see like some metric, and I think this is a, this is a ridiculous metric, is as soon as you're using it recreationally, well, then you're misusing it. It's a substance use disorder, which I think is ridiculous, right? But then at what point do we say, okay, well, that's that's dangerous? Because you said using Kratom three to five grams three times a day. If I was using three to five grams of Kratom th three times a day, I would I would probably feel like I have a substance use disorder. But is that not the case for somebody who is using it to treat chronic pain to replace Percocets, 
but would it be if I was doing it just... So I'm just wondering, what are the metrics by which the research and even personally yourself would consider, okay, now we're in the realm of this is subs kratom use disorder. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a good question. And I don't know specifically what uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, what, what the group actually uh, used as the defining moment when somebody transitioned from just regular use or whatever you want to classify as regular use to uh, developing a, a use disorder. Um, the way that we would usually classify or the way that I have known to classify uh, misuse or abuse of a, uh, a substance um, would be uh, what, what, what a precursor is to the, a dependence development is tolerance. So uh, there first needs to be um, a, a kind of increase in the amount that we take, uh, either amount in terms of uh, how much we take per dose or the frequency with which we take it. Um, that is kind of, for me, an, a, an important marker that indicates that somebody is going that somebody's at risk at least of developing a dependence. Um, so when we talk about Kratom in this setting, if for example, uh, we have, have a good Kratom product and it actually gives you on the label a, a suggested dose <clears throat> and it says take three tablespoons three times a day. Um, I would always suggest that somebody who just starts off with Kratom starts off with a lower dose and sees where they meet their their goal of pain relief or relief from whatever they are seeking to um, treat, uh, no matter if that is you know a, a, a mental uh, condition or a physical condition. Um, uh, and 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 once you hit kind of that wall where it says take three tablespoons three times a day, then I would I would be a little bit hesitant to suggest go over that because then you kind of enter the realm where it's hmm, that is kind of like you know it's kind of like a prescription kind of you take three three doses per day right um, now I wouldn't necessarily call that. Uh, that you are already developing a dependence, uh, but you might develop a tolerance at that point. Now, we are getting tolerant to lots of things. Coffee is one that you that you mentioned. Um, what we need to be at that point, we need to be aware of that we don't let that slide too out of out of control. Um, so, if we say, okay, three doses, three tablespoons a day. Um, and be very careful with controlling how much higher we want to get. Uh, if we know that uh, we are we are we are setting our limit at four tablespoons three times a day, then that's fine. But if we creep up further than that, then we know that something is is wrong, and we need to. And if we cannot stop ourselves at that point, then I would say we are on the way, that person is on the way of developing a dependence because they lost the control over how much they are actually taking. It's kind of now it's actually the substance is kind of in control a little bit more and they have that, like you call it a physical dependence that the body needs the drug to actually function. So the tolerance is there and now the dependence kind of really kicks in and they, they crave more of that drug in order to get to that point where they have either pain relief or their, their repressive symptoms or even the euphoria uh, kicks in. So it might be something else. And at that point, I would say you need help because now the substance actually has control. Uh, it's in the driver's seat. So that that's why I would say uh, a... Uh, there, I would, I would say, okay, now it's time to to get help. Hmm, interesting. Um, I, I, I got, I kind of got stuck there for a second on, on the language of the substances in control, uh, which is very common language. 
but then also it's common language used in scenarios where I think it's being expressed as a metaphor, but then also on another level, the scenario in which it's used, which is generally like in, it's a language that's very common in sort of the medical ends of things. It's like, oh, well, now the substance has taken control in the situation. That's the dividing line. But then we also don't see plants or other things as having agency. So it's interesting to, 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 to ascribe agenda to a uh, to a substance which is to control you um, while also saying no 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 only human intelligence is the only type of intelligence that exists and everything else is is subservient mechanistic and and, and blah 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 you know like uh, i mean that's just like a that's that's a philosophical discussion we don't have to go into but i just thought the language <laughs> caught me in an interesting way uh so it, when when you were when we were in the email, you said one of the things you could talk about is what to watch out for when starting Kratom. Um, is 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 this discussion around like the adverse effects, you know, like nausea, so on and so forth, start low, go slow, kind of thing, and then don't exceed sort of the recommended dose, don't exceed your own dose. Are these the types of things that you watch out for, or is there something else specifically that you wanted to make sure people heard? So I think what's important is really, uh, for one, is to uh, to try to find a product that is well labeled. So uh, really, all of the ingredients are listed. Um, that it is, if possible, really just the ground up powder of the leaves of mitragyna, that uh, speciosa, that it is, if possible even containing the percentage of mitragynin and 7 hydroxymitragynin that is present in it. Um, we call that a standardized extract. Um, and if you can purchase it from the same manufacturer or supplier uh, always, and it's that guarantees you that the product has consistent uh, content from batch to batch, um, I think that's important because if you if you use the same dose, you know how much you're getting um, uh, from from every spoon or from every you know from every dose that you're taking. Um, there should be uh, a statement that it it should only be available to people who are 18 years or older. Um, I think that's kind of a reasonable statement to make. Um, I realize that some people might disagree with, with the age restrictions, but I think it's a reasonable statement to make. I agree. Um, and when it comes to uh, pregnant women, um, that we don't have sufficient data uh, to support the use during pregnancy and lactation, and therefore they should not be taking it at this point. I think that's also a reasonable cautionary statement to include. Um, there should be a dose recommendation on it. Um, that shows uh, that the manufacturer is responsible and that they care about uh, their consumers. Uh, and also uh, potentially a statement about um, that it might impair um, uh, driving uh, so that people should be careful and that it might cause drug interactions. So that, that are kind of statements where I would say this is a responsible manufacturer that is somebody who cares about their customers, it is somebody who who actually really wants to provide a, a good product uh, to uh, to consumers. Um, and then when it comes to actually starting Kratom, I would go really low and slow. So if you don't start off with like one tablespoon or one teaspoon, one tablespoon is probably the best, one tablespoon, uh, if it's in powder form, uh, dissolve it in uh, in either water, uh, hot water or cold water. Hot water is probably better. Uh, and then add some honey or something like that if you don't like the taste. Um, or an orange juice. Some people put it in orange juice. Um, I question how much better the absorption is with orange juice, though, uh, to be honest. Uh, I, I don't think that you get more absorption from it, but I might be wrong. Well, swim uses uh, is uses orange juice because it's the best way to suppress the taste. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. it's the best way to suppress the taste. But I, from from a chemistry point of view, I don't think that you get a lot into the system, so you don't get a lot absorbed. So, so, so is it better to um, do it with hot water, like because you're actively starting to extract the? That was another question that I, I I didn't ask, but I wanted to. Now we're slightly off topic of what we're talking about, but it 
is is it, does it say I'm thinking economically about my kratom? Yeah, I want to take a certain amount. I want like financially, I don't want to spend too much. I don't want to take more than is needed to get the effect that I want. Do I want to extract it to some degree in hot water, or does it matter at all? Hot water is the way to go. Hot water is definitely a better extraction method. Uh, you can let it cool afterwards because once it is extracted, it will stay extracted. The mitragynin. Uh, if we go, if we talk specifically mitragynin now uh, and seven hydroxy mitragynin, I cannot uh, speak to other potential active components. So um, uh, I, I cannot tell about other stuff. But for for those two. I would say that hot water currently is the best method. Um, and the more acidic the solution is, um, I would think the worse uh, the the extraction is going to be of mitragynin and 7 hydroxy mitragynin uh, because the chemistry tells us that it's not going to be going into solution. Hmm. Okay, that's... Uh, I'm, I'm, putting, I'm putting that away for a rainy day. Uh, so what... <laughs> um, yeah, what what was your what was your fi final things there around watching out when you're starting? I mean, I think it's great on on a on a safety level to be interacting with companies that clearly have integrity around their product, um, and then also on a on a on a market pers from a market perspective to be voting with your dollar, as they say, and encouraging those types of practices and rewarding financially the companies that are providing this quality of product and this type of integrity in their business practices. That's difficult here in Canada because uh, kratom is only sold as incense here in Krat uh, in Canada, as far as I know. They're, it's not allowed for human consumption. So if you make any suggestions at all that there's any type of consumption going on, then you're now selling an unregistered something for... for now you're breaking the law. Unlike in the U.S., you could just be like, these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA and then get away with selling pretty much anything that isn't scheduled. Um, so that's that's a limitation here in Canada. Like any kratom that I've interacted with has just come in a bag that is said like this is kratom, and it says this is a particular kind of kratom. So I want to ask you about that. Um, but is there anything else about watching like what to watch out for that we're, from starting um, that you want to say before we move on to this basically last question I have? Um, no, that, that's pretty much it. So start slow and uh, wait for the effects to kick in. So you might have to wait a little bit longer since everything is taken orally. Uh, it might take an hour or two uh, for the effects to kick in. So if after 20 minutes you don't see an effect, wait. Um, don't take another dose right away. Uh, wait, it just takes longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I'm thinking about obviously not kratom at all, but that's sort of like a that sort of age old uh, case report of someone being like, I took one and it didn't work. And then I took the second one and then they both hit at the same time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like uh, now I'm in trouble uh, or now I'm in a great place, depending on how you look at it. Um, so uh, yeah, my final question is about strain. Okay. We've got, all right, we got ba Indonesian kratom. We got Thai kratom, Bali. We've got elephant kratom. We've got the white you know, white kratom, we've got red vein kratom, we got red vein Bali and red vein this. And, you know, like, is there any meaningful pharmacological differences between these different sort of strains of kratom enough so that it matters to the consumer um, when they're purchasing? Or are they all generally sort of the same and i mean obviously different kratom products will be different you know like one yield might have higher mitragynin than another yield but i mean this in the description is red vein actually more sedating than green vein or are these sort of just like marketing strategies so as far as I know from uh, Malaysia, from, from the research I work with in Malaysia, all of them are harvested from the exact same tree, um, potentially at different time points of uh, the actual leaf development. So uh, it might be that the green vein um, strain is a younger leaf uh, than the red vein or the white vein. Uh, now I, I heard of a golden um, that is coming out. Um, so 
in that regard, it might be at different stages of leaf development, and that might actually alter the chemistry. And as far as I'm aware, and we have tested uh, different um, strains, different vein strains of uh, leaf leaves of of of, of kratom. It doesn't make a difference as far as mitragynin and 7 hydroxy mitragynin levels. So whatever it is, what might cause a different level of sedation or stimulant effects um, that people report um, that they feel, it is not related to the mitragynin or 7 hydroxy mitragynin levels. Um, so that that much I can say. What it might be other ingredients uh, that are related or that are causative, um, but not that. Okay, that's good to know. I had also read somewhere that um, that most kratom companies are just uh, like they might get labeled as such, but where they're coming from is it's all just cut off the tree and ground up and then sent to you and then it's given a name and you have no idea <laughs> really what's in there. Unless like yourself, you have a company or you, like you suggested, sorry, that you have a company that does a standardized um, extract or can give you a sort of a report on like what is the alkaloid content which unfortunately does not happen in Canada I can get kratom or super kratom those are my options different veins different strains super not super those are my options um, so just gonna make a quick I think I think I've, I've 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 asked all the questions I intended to ask I'd love to come to a close here although do you feel like there's something that's either missing from the conversation so far or something like that you'd like to end on to ensure that it really uh really oh i remember the last thing i wanted to talk about okay pardon me i got excited um with the legal situation with kratom in the united states there's different ways to look at this the dea is like oh we don't know anything about this it's unregulated it's dangerous let's get rid of it now another way to look at it is the DEA generally has a pretty shitty track record for um, making policies that are entirely influenced on who they're in bed with politically and economically. Um, and so in particular, like say the scheduling of cannabis, for example, or the scheduling of MDMA, which they scheduled um, uh, despite the fact that I think it was a, a, the Supreme Court or another court said, yeah, don't schedule it, schedule one. And they were like, tough luck with the DEA if we do what we want. Um, and and that with Kratom, there's been some suggestions that the reason there's a, a fast push to criminalize it is very much to suppress its use of replacing pharmaceuticals, but also to eliminate the distribution of a natural product so that pharmaceutical companies can patent some sort of like remix of mitragynine and then, pro and then market it as a new pharmaceutical in in your explorations of what's happening legally with kratom is there is there is there is there reasonable um is it reasonable to give credence to this idea that it's there's some sort of larger suppression of kratom that's going on that's for profit seeking motives or do you feel pretty pretty confident to say that it's probably just a public health thing so uh, when it, I cannot tell you really uh, the motivation of the DEA, to be honest, because the DEA has been relatively quiet on Kratom. They have received from the FDA the so-called eight-factor analysis. An eight-factor analysis basically goes through all of the steps of what are the current knowledge uh, in regards to uh, uh, medical uses? Are there any medical uses? What is our understanding of the pharmacology and what are potential public health risks and how can we evaluate dependence issues and all of that stuff? And we partially know what the eight-factor analysis of the FDA is. It's actually been a position paper uh, from somebody who I'm working with, uh, Jack Henningfield, uh, who also did uh, an eight-factor analysis on Kratom, uh, which has been published, um, uh, which is not really along the lines of where, where the FDA wants to go. So if the DEA wanted to place Kratom in Schedule 1, they could have done so two years ago. They didn't do that, uh, which is unusual because the DEA was 
announcing its intent back in 2016 to place uh, Quartum into Schedule 1 and received a, a lot of noise back from the public and from some lawmakers as well to not do so. And they withdrew that intent, which was very unusual at the time. Uh, and then they didn't take any action for the past four years. Um, is this related to a potential influence by opioid manufacturers? I do not know. I, 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 I'm not that much deep entrenched in, uh, in, in legalese and, and, and that kind of stuff. What I know is that Mitragynin back in the 1970s was actually considered as a potential lead compound for opioids, for a new opioid. And then it was dropped, um, interest was lost uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so if it will make a comeback, hard to tell. Uh, so far, what we really need uh, with, uh, with Kratom and its, uh, and its components, its constituents, is really uh, actual clinical studies. Uh, to show uh, what are its effects, uh, what, uh, how can we, uh, how can we best help uh, patients um, uh, to uh, either way, uh, either as a as a as a potential mitigation strategy for opioid withdrawal uh, or other uh, other drug. Uh, disorder withdrawal situations or for acute and chronic pain or for a another disorder. So I think uh, clinical studies is really what is critical. And getting that through FDA at the moment, that is the hard step because the FDA has said uh, we are seeing mitragynin and 7-hydroxymitragynin as opioids basically. And that has made it very difficult to get clinical studies approved or even submit them. I understand the FDA's public health concern. Uh, that's what they are there for. That's their mission. Um, and I don't know if this is necessarily uh, an issue of them, um, you know, intermingling with opioid manufacturers, um, but they are looking at this as, oh, this might be another opioid being on the market um, and we don't want that. Uh, I think that it is, it would be good if we would have a better interaction between the scientific community that has been advocating for more research on Kratom um, with the FDA, with regulatory agencies to actually get moving on clinical trials. Uh, so that we have more data to either support um, its its use um, and its benefits or to make a determination that uh, maybe it's not so good to use it. But we need more data in order to say that. We cannot base it entirely on what the FDA said to just classify it as an opioid and then be done with it. I think that is not the right approach that is being taken at the moment. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much for that commentary at the end there. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll throw that same question I just asked before, if there's anything in particular you feel we missed or you would like to really like lay home as the last statements before I get more contact details about your work. Uh, I hope that I, uh, that I was able to, to provide uh, good answers to your questions. I, I feel this was a great conversation uh, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, James. Oh, thank you, Oliver. I really enjoyed it as well. Uh, so how do people find out more about your work, essentially? More about you and what you do? So uh, I'm uh, with uh, I'm a, a, a faculty with the University of Florida at the College of Pharmacy. Um, and I've got a website there. Uh, people can visit me there or they can simply Google my name, Oliver Grundman, and then Kratom <laughs> will likely pull me up at the moment. That's probably one of the most popular searches on Google for my name at the moment. Or Oliver Grantman, University of Florida. That's also possible. Great. And any, any particular uh, resources around Kratom? Like you mentioned the American Kratom Association multiple times. If people are specifically being like, okay, I want to get more information about the substance that I'm using, um, where would you recommend they go? 
so uh, there are uh, the American Quantum Association is a great resource. I know that there are many other. You mentioned Reddit in between. There are many forums. Um, obviously, that is uh, information that sometimes is not as well moderated or filtered, uh, and this can be good and can be bad at times. You know, because you get sometimes unfiltered information. Um, there are some free articles on PubMed uh, that are accessible. I realize that are very scientific in scope. Um, NIDA actually has some good facts uh, that are, I think, uh, relatively well balanced. That's the National Institutes of, of Drug Abuse. And they have uh, a distinct different perspective on Kratom, I think, um, than, um, than the FDA has. Uh, so uh, that would be a, a good uh, way to go. Um, other than that, um, people can certainly reach out to me. We have also a website on Kratom on um, the College of Pharmacy, uh, which provides a little bit of overview. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we can always, uh, there are multiple faculty involved in our College of Pharmacy and research on Kratom. So we always there to assist as well for questions. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Grunman, for being on the show. Oh, certainly. It was my pleasure, James. Thank you very much. And cut. Okay. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, if you like the show, please share it with a friend. Head to at mine clips YouTube channel, secondary channel. I'll have some smaller clips. Pretty much the entire episode is cut into pieces. So if there's a part that you liked, you will find it on at mine clips. Very few subscribers there right now. So your uh, subscribe, your likes, your hitting the bell. Uh, if you're a YouTube person, you know what hitting the bell is all about. Uh, much appreciated. So head there um, and share a clip, subscribe. And uh, if you are not yet a patron of the show and you'd like to support the show financially, becoming a patron on Patreon would be an awesome way to do that. Or you can leave a one-time PayPal donation. Um, the links to do so are in the show notes of this episode. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you for taking care of yourself and staying safe, whatever that means, uh, wherever you are. And I will see you on the next episode here of Adventures Through the Mind. Take care.